Good afternoon. The Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, U.S. Postal Service, and Labor Policy will come to order. The Subcommittee meets today to consider H.R. 2309, the Postal Reform Act of 2011. The Subcommittee will now consider H.R. 2309, the Postal Reform Act of 2011, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. The United States Postal Service is broke. Mail volume has plummeted by more than 20 percent over the last five years, and the decline is expected to continue. Labor costs are 80 percent of the Postal Service's total expenses. Existing compensation and benefits contracts leave management unable to effectively reduce the size or cost of this workforce. If the Postal Service were a private business, it would have to declare bankruptcy and completely reorganize itself. On September 30, 2011, when its fiscal year ends, the Postal Service expects to declare a $10 billion loss for the fiscal year, reach its $15 billion statutory debt limit, default on a required $5.5 billion payment due to the U.S. Treasury to prefund its own employees' retired health care costs, and by next summer, the Postal Service will not make payroll and mail delivery will begin to grind to a halt. The handwriting is on the wall. Either we make a necessary systemic changes to the postal infrastructure or we allow this proud American institution to disintegrate before our eyes. Short-term fixes that rely on taxpayer-funded bailouts will not save the Post Office. That approach, evidenced in the proposal forwarded to Congress by the White House earlier this week, is an attempt to find an easy way out. By putting our collective heads in the sand and wishing the problem away will not just cost taxpayers money in the near term. Postponing the Postal Service's day of reckoning will make it more likely that the American people will ultimately have to pay tens of billions of dollars to make good on the Postal Service's obligations to its retirees. In short, the only way out for the U.S. Postal Service's current mess is to vastly restructure its operations, reducing the organization's workforce and labor costs and providing it tools needed to compete in the 21st century. Today we will consider H.R. 2309, the Postal Reform Act. It will create a receivership entity to balance postal finances, extend a collateralized debt limit line to ensure that its mail is still delivered, right-size and modernize the postal workforce and infrastructure, and eliminate a number of unfunded mandates on the United States Postal Service, such as six-day mail delivery. There is no denying that this bill incorporates many politically difficult decisions. But I believe the American people didn't send us here to do what is easy. They sent us here to do what is right and what may be hard. I strongly believe that there is room for bipartisan support on this issue, and I hope we can work together to make this proposal even better as it moves through the legislative process. The status quo for the Postal Service is no longer sustainable, and reform is urgently needed. I thank my colleagues for being here today, and I look forward to working with them to ensure the Postal Services are available to all Americans for at least the next 200 years. And now I recognize the ranking member from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ensuring the long-term solvency and profitability of the United States Postal Service is probably one of the most important legislative actions our subcommittee will tackle in this Congress, one of the few government agencies explicitly authorized in the Constitution of the United States, the Postal Service's value and contribution to the fabric of our nation and our economy are undeniable. The second oldest department or agency of the present-day federal government, the Postal Service employs roughly 600,000 Americans, reliably delivering six days a week to over 150 million residences and businesses in every city, county, congressional district, state, and U.S. territory. Through its roughly 32,000 retail locations and hundreds of mailing processing and distribution centers, the Postal Service has a record of offering top-notch service at some of the world's most affordable rates. This explains why for the sixth consecutive year in a row, the Postal Service has been named the most trusted government agency and the sixth most trusted business in the nation by the Poneman Institute. Further, the Postal Service stands as the hallmark of a trillion-dollar mailing industry upon which millions of Americans rely to earn a living. Therefore, revamping and modernizing the United States Postal Service should not be viewed as a legislative burden, but rather a policy-making opportunity to put in place 
additional enhancements and operational flexibilities that will allow the Postal Service to thrive for decades to come. Unfortunately, the bill we're considering this afternoon, H.R. 2309, the Postal Reform Act of 2011, falls far short of that goal. While we may agree that given the extraordinary financial challenges the Postal Service presently faces, it's absolutely necessary that we collectively, and by collectively I'm referring to Democrats and Republicans in both the House and Senate, including the administration, postal management and workers, and the mailers, we all must work together to come up with a reasonable and constructive solution to address the Postal Service operational and financial challenges. However, before we tackle issues such as changing delivery frequency and drastically cutting service and laying off hardworking Americans, we should consider a more palatable course of action. In addition to H.R. 2309, there are now several other bills that have been introduced this session, such as my own legislation, H.R. 1351, as well as proposals put forth by Representatives Cummings and Connolly and recently the Obama administration. Each offer suggestions for helping to put the Postal Service's financial house back in order. I certainly hope that today's markup will provide us with a chance to have some of those proposals included in whatever measure is ultimately recommended for consideration to the full committee. In closing, I want to express my appreciation for the work that this subcommittee has performed thus far by holding hearings examining the state of the Postal Service. I now only ask that we proceed cautiously and cooperatively as, consider, as we consider how best to reform, modernize, and reshape one of our nation's most valued assets, the United States Postal Service. When the Government Accountability Office issued its April 2010 report examining strategies and options to facilitate progress towards financial viability of the Postal Service, I recall it recommending the development of a new postal business model rather than the dismantling or takeover of the United States Postal Service. To that end, Mr. Chairman, know that I continue to look forward to working together to accomplish needed reforms of the United States Postal Service, currently uh, the business model, and I yield back the balance of our time. And I do appreciate your, your, uh, your courtesy in allowing me to go over on the time. Appreciate that. Uh, no problem. Thank you. I uh, would now like to uh, recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for an opening statement. I want to thank you very much for the uh, Chairman's courtesy. As one of our nation's most visible and trusted institutions, the Postal Service reaches every corner of every State and truly binds our nation together. It is critical for Congress to act carefully and quickly on legislation to ensure that the Postal Service can meet its current financial challenges and thrive for decades to come and for generations yet unborn. This process will succeed only if it is bipartisan. Mr. Chairman, I agree with you when you say the handwriting is on the wall, but we are the handwriters, and we can create the kind of system that is long-lasting, that does not f fire people uh, and in this difficult economy, and at the same time right-size the Postal Service. In this spirit, I introduced a short-term legislation last week to postpone a payment the Postal Service is required to make to its retiree health fund on September 30th. My goal was simply to create additional time for negotiations between the House, the Senate, and the Administration on this very, very important issue. Throughout the work week, we worked in a bipartisan manner with the House Appropriations Committee. As a result, the continuing resolution now includes a provision postponing the Postal Service payment. We were encouraged with the cooperative way the appropriators and the committee handled this issue. Unfortunately, the issue has been handled very differently here in this committee, and I do appreciate, Mr. Chairman, you saying that you wanted to work in a bipartisan way. However, I believe that this matter has been politicized and the issue needlessly has been taking steps to aggregate rather than solve challenges faced by the Postal Service. I have been eager to work in a bipartisan way, but to date the Chairman has refused, Chairman Issa, that is, to do so. Rather than work together on a consensus bill that could garner wide, bi wide bipartisan and bicameral support, and I remind you, this has got to be bicameral, uh, the bill has now been made even more extreme and even more objectionable to stakeholders than when it was first introduced. For example, in its current form, the Chairman's bill would set an artificial tripwire for the Postal Service to come under the authority of a control board. 
This Board would then be authorized to abrogate contracts that workers negotiated in good faith with the Postal Service Management so that the Board could terminate workers without even giving them a severance. It is this Committee's responsibility to consider and develop legislation that actually has a chance of being passed by Congress and signed into law. This bill does not meet that test. Faced with the majority's refusal to entertain bipartisan solutions, we have been forced to introduce our own legislation to address these issues in a more constructive way. This week, Ranking Member Stephen Lynch and I introduced H.R. 2967, the Innovate to Deliver Act. Unlike other proposals that merely cut services, terminate employees, and eliminate post offices, our bill tackles fundamental challenges with fundamental changes that will reverse the Postal Service's fiscal curve. In other words, we are doing that handwriting on the wall. It does this by authorizing the Postal Service to enter into new lines of business that leverage its unique advantages like other businesses do, and it gives it the flexibility that it needs to accomplish that. Post offices are the central hubs of many rural and urban communities. Our legislation will en enable the Postal Service to take advantage of this presence to provide new services and products, such as check cashing, facility leasing, and retail services. The bill will also create a new chief innovation officer to drive the development of these new products and services. Our bill complements these authorities with common sense measures to right size the Postal Service workforce and facilities in a very responsible way. Together, these provisions will empower the Postal Service to function more like a business by focusing on profitability and accountability to stakeholders, in this case, the American people. I ask the Committee to consider our legislation as soon as possible. I continue to hope the Committee will abandon the, bi the partisan approach that has pursued to date. And I remind all of us, back, back, back in 2010, there are some who say that the American people were sending all kinds of messages, but I know one thing. They sent a, a clear message that they want Republicans and Democrats to work together to resolve their problems to resolve their problems in a reasonable and practical way. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Now I would like to recognize the Chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. I thank the Chairman. I regret that the Ranking Member distorts the record of this committee trying to work on a bipartisan basis. Mr. Cummings, I have reached out to you repeatedly. I have made sure that this markup was part of an open process in which we made sure you saw the new language well in advance. I assured you and I assure the American people and the postal workers that, in fact, getting to a profitable situation with the core business is our requirement and that is all I am dedicated to. I do not want any trigger to kick in. I want, in fact, the postal, uh, postmaster and the board to do their job. Ultimately. I was very supportive of the seven-week extension that is part of the CR. Additionally, I have told uh, many members of minority, including yourself, uh, Mr. Cummings, that we will have huge transition cost. I believe that many of the things which I have called a bailout or a denial of the problem may ultimately be part of how we create the headroom for the transition, because no company goes from a $10 billion loss on $65 billion in revenue to break even or a profit without huge transitional cost. I, too, share your concern that you alluded to. Postal workers, more than 100,000, are able to retire today with full benefits, perhaps as closer to 200,000 over the next two years. But even they deserve to be given fair notice that we in order to right-size the post office are going to have to recognize a system that is beneficial to the future of the post office. The last thing I want to do is to tell permanent postal workers that we are going to abruptly have them leave the service before they can receive their full pension that they anticipated and without any compensation. The intention of this bipartisan bill, and it will be bipartisan if I possibly can make it, is, in fact, to make sure that we get an amount of dollars in savings greater than what it takes to break even, because that creates the revenue that allows for modernization of the fleet and fair compensation to those who 
are no longer needed in a smaller, more efficient post office, but at the same time, we owe them for their years of service. We owe them a bargain they entered into 15, 20, 30 years ago. So I, I do think it is hard for us to come to agreement. I do believe the American people want us to reach consensus on this. But sometimes there are problems, and they are not partisan. There are Republicans and Democrats who do not want to go from six days to five days, which the President wants to do, which the Postmaster wants to do. There are those who simply say we should withhold less from future obligations for pension and health care. But none of them are willing to risk not having a Federal backstop if they are underwithheld. So I do so any support I would have for temporarily abating that has to be based on an anticipation that eventually they can fully meet that obligation. That is our obligation to the taxpayers. It is also our obligation to the pensioners now and in the future. Let us be honest as we go into this bill. Eighty percent of the cost of postal delivery, more or less a percent or two, depending upon who you talk to, is labor. Now, we have two fundamental things we can do to reduce that, uh, the loss related to labor. We can reduce the pay and benefits of those hardworking men and women, or we can right-size the number of people and fully compensate those who are no longer needed. Those are two basic choices. The third choice, the one that has often been chosen, which is we will increase the price of postage, is a fool's errand, because ultimately you can only go so far before you force more and more people out of using the post office. The post office today is a good value. It is not overpriced, but I would have to be honest, it is not grossly underpriced. The problem is not the revenue they receive. The problem is the cost of delivery. Now, our bill anticipates 37 million or so households no longer getting their mail in a chute in their front door, but being transitioned to a box a short distance away, like 109 million homes currently have. That saves over five, five and a half million dollars. But not one penny of savings occurs unless we reduce the workforce over a relatively short period of time accordingly. Now, we have postal unions that we have worked with for years, worked with, and they have worked with the postmaster on concessions. I would ask unanimous consent for an additional minute. Without objection. Thank you. We have worked with those unions. I intend to continue working with all of the organizations that are involved, including all of those who use large amounts of postal services. It is going to be hard. The goal of this committee and in every amendment we consider and in every modification that the ranking member or any member might offer, I would like to preserve service to the greatest extent possible. I would like to retain the value, the low cost value of good delivery around our country because I believe that is important. Do we have a transition that primarily is going to be based on labor? Yes. Do I know that maintaining those rural post offices and some urban is important? Yes. Do I believe we have to reduce the number of processing centers in order to be more efficient? I think we all know we do, and none of us want it to be one that employs in our state or our city. These are hard decisions. The bill that Mr. Ross is marking up today, deliberately to give all of us plenty of time to look at it before we go to the full committee, is anticipated to leave as many options on the table as possible and mandate the minimum amount necessary. And if you will work with us in that process to add additional items that could add additional savings, we will work with you on how we figure out a way to fully fund the dollars necessary to modernize the postal fleet, to in fact reward those people for their service and make this the kind of transition both sides of the aisle can be very proud of. I thank the chairman for his leadership. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I, would, would, I, would, I would yield to the ranking member. Just for one minute. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, uh, Chairman Issa, for your words. Um, I think it is very important that, first of all, I want to thank you for acknowledging the efforts of the unions. Anytime folks cut 100,000 people since 2007 or 8, that's phenomenal. And they have been extremely cooperative. But I look forward to working with you. Um, I think in, this, in these difficult times, um, I have pledged, and I am sure all of us have pledged, to make sure that we be about the business of creating jobs, not 
eliminating them. And so if we can, whatever we have to do, I think we have to do it with, and again, I, I, I want to make sure, I think everybody agrees here, we want to do this process in a way that in the end we effectively and efficiently right-size the post office which is much, with as much compassion as possible, trying to maintain the prices like you talked about. Uh, and, I, and I look forward to working with you. I'm glad you, you said what you said, and I appreciate it. Look forward to working. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your, for your courtesy. And I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I will hold the record open until the end of the day for any members who would like to submit a written statement. Uh, we will now open the bill, H.R. 2309, for consideration. With H without objection, H.R. 2309 will be Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I Pleasure. object to the unanimous consent request and reserve a point of order against the amendment. So noted. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Section 311 of the amendment and the nature of substitute contains provisions relating to the Federal Employees' Compensation Act. Uh, those provisions are within the jurisdiction of the Education and Labor Committee. And further, the provisions requiring the Social Security Administration to disclose earnings information are within the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee. Section 311, therefore, is not germane to the bill and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is out of order in its present form. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lynch, for the, uh, for, for the point. Um, the, um, uh, the provisions of this uh, substitute um, do deal uh, strictly with the, uh, the Postal Service. Uh, while this committee does share jurisdiction uh, with other committees with regard to the Federal workforce and compensation and, and, and uh, workers' compensation benefits, um, it is the opinion of the Chair that this substitute uh, is germane, uh, stating within the confines of its own jurisdiction and therefore would uh, find it out of order. If I could, Mr. Chairman, we did receive confirmation from the Parliamentarian's Office that Section 311 is subject to a point of order that it violates Rule 10. So uh, there seems to be a, a difference between the Parliamentarian's interpretation of this bill and, and uh, the Committee's. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I will take that under advisement. In the meantime, I would like to recognize uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, I appreciate the work we are doing here and the uh, the opportunity that this is uh, really the first step, first step in the process, and we'll have opportunities in full committee to uh, uh, to to really consider what's being done. But I'd, I'd like to briefly comment on the provisions in Section 311 of the substitute, which would make changes to the Federal Employees Compensation Act or FECA. Uh, FECA is the Workers' Compensation Program for all federal employees. It's my understanding that any changes to FECA, the FECA program, including those made with respect to postal workers, fall within the jurisdiction of the Education and Workforce Committee and more, more directly within the jurisdiction of the Subcommittee on Workforce Protections, which I chair. Um, I would note that the Committee on Education and the Workforce has and continues to review and address these issues. As recently as July, the committee reported a bill to make changes to the FECA program for all federal employees. In fact, I've also signed on a recent July 8th request uh, from uh, the Education and Workforce Committee to GAO asking for their assistance in reviewing many of the reforms addressed in Section 311 so that we can assess the uh, extent of their impact. And I would like, without objection, to submit that uh, letter of request uh, to the subcommittee. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, as this bill uh, moves forward, I would ask uh, the chairman to consider revisiting the substantive issues addressed in Section 311 and work with the Education and Workforce Committee going forward to resolve any jurisdictional concerns. Um, uh, jurisdiction is important, and uh, and policy is important, and um, uh, there may have been some. Uh, some mix-ups at this point, but we would like to remedy those, those, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. And I, I, too, apologize for any mix-up at this point and respect very much the jurisdiction of the subcommittee that you chair and, and also agree that while we try to tend 
to focus solely on the postal employees, that the, the FECA provisions do encompass the Federal employee workforce, which is under the, the shared jurisdiction uh, of, of both committees. And hopefully we will be able to work this out as we move this bill along uh, for your, your committee, your subcommittee, to have its input and, and the jurisdiction necessary to make sure the remedies are provided that we seek. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Uh, Mr. Lynch. I, I appreciate the gentleman's uh, remarks. I, I agree with him uh, 100 percent. Uh, I'm trying to resolve this. The bill in its current form is not an order, and that's according to the parliamentarian. Would, would, uh, would, would we, uh, could we agree to, to, to strike 311 and allow it to be handled within the gentleman's uh, uh, committee um, as he suggests and then move on with the balance of, of, of the bill? I think that would be an order. Uh, Mr. Azar? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike last word. I, I believe you have already ruled on this, that you believe it is within order. Notwithstanding that, I will work with the, uh, the Chairman of the uh, Ed and Labor Committee to either A, reach a consensus, or B, have a sequential referral if it is triggered as a result of today's uh, markup. As Mr. Lynch knows, this will go to the full committee. We will have more than two weeks to vet this. Uh, and certainly, uh, my relationship with my fellow chairman is such that we are going to ensure that either the sequential referral that would have occurred to begin with happens or other changes uh, made are necessary. It is likely, in my opinion, just as chairman to chairman there, that they will waive, since this is wholly within the postal system, it is well within their ability to waive this very limited portion of an interpretation. If they do not, we will work with them to resolve that. Uh, but at this point, I, I believe the Chairman has ruled, and uh, with those assurances, I presume we can continue with an underlying bill uh, or the amendment, uh, because ultimately it is a judgment call about which came first, the chicken being postal or this question. And I might mention, Mr. Chairman, if we were to take the postal workers 100 percent out of FERS, it would be 100 percent within our jurisdiction. This is already an independent agency that has special rules which are controlled under the Postal Reform Act uh, or several acts. So I believe we are well within our jurisdiction. But having said that, uh, I believe that this objection is one that we will, we will work through. And as you know, parliamentarians often answer questions based on, well, is that potentially outside the scope? Yes. Does it change our jurisdiction to go even further if we chose to? And the answer is no. We have the jurisdiction uh, to go much further. We could effectively privatize the post office, something we are not looking to do here. So, Mr. Chairman, I believe you ruled. Uh, the gentleman may be interested in a vote. I hope not. I hope we can resolve this between now and the full committee. And he certainly could uh, make that known at the full committee if it hasn't been resolved. Yield back. Well, Thank you. Point of uh, order. Uh, the, the, the chair has ruled on the on, on the previous point. If you'd like to vote on it, that that's fine. But I'll recommend I, I just want to order. I, I don't think the gentleman. But I'm trying to respond to the gentleman. Uh, I'd like to strike the last word as the gentleman has. Uh, we we actually asked the parliamentarian. So the, the subcommittee chair is not the last word on on a point of order. We have the rules of the house, and we we designate the parliamentarian. Uh, to, to actually be the final arbiter of rules within the House. We have submitted this, uh, this specific legislation, this specific section, and, and asked the parliamentarian if this is in order or not in order within this subcommittee. Yeah, we could, we could talk about you know, the price of corn in this committee. It would not be in order, uh, and, and it would be pointless. We have got the process backwards. You, you, you don't begin to debate Section 311, which is not an order in this House, uh, until you get a waiver from the other committees of jurisdiction, which, would, under, the, under the parliamentarian's ruling, uh, belongs within the House Education and, and, and Labor Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. If they had indeed waived their right of jurisdiction, I would agree with the gentleman's position wholeheartedly and we would proceed. That has not happened. As it stands today, this legislation, this section, is not an order within this subcommittee. And so uh, are we going to spend but would, the, would the gentleman yield? What, yes, I, I would. Uh, the parliamentarians do not have a vote here. Ultimately, the chair makes a ruling. It is, is relative to a vote, uh, and the same would occur at the full committee. The fact is we have we're extending the understanding since we gave you the language 
and you are only raising the objection here, we have not had an independent opportunity to go beyond our own parliamentarian who has advised the Chairman and he has ruled. So I call for the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the question being called on the appeal, is it the appeal of the, uh, the, 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 the Chair's ruling on the point of order. All those in, in favor of the uh, uh, point of appeal? The table. The, I, Mr. Chairman, I move to table the appeal of the ruling of the Chair. Okay. All those in favor of, of tabling the appeal signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The uh, appeal is tabled. Request a roll call. The clerk uh, will call the roll on the appeal, uh, the tabling of the appeal. Mr. Ross. Yes. Mr. Ross votes yes. Mr. Amash. Yes. Mr. Amash votes yes. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Chaffetz. Yes. Mr. Mack. Yes. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes yes. Mr. Gowdy. Mr. Issa. Mr. Issa votes yes. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes no. Ms. Norton? Mr. Connolly? No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Davis? No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Chaffetz, you're not recorded. Mr. Chaffetz votes yes. The clerk will report. Six yeses, three noes. Um, the, the, four. The motion, Sorry, four no's. The, the motion to uh, table the appeal is, is, is uh, granted. I am counting four people on this side. I am not I, sure. I corrected it. Oh, I am sorry. Six four four no's. Oh, okay. Let, let the re record reflect there were six ayes and four nays. Yes. Okay. In support of the um, motion to table the appeal. Uh, the, 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 the clerk will now designate the bill. H.R. 2309, a bill to restore the financial solvency of the United States Postal Service and to ensure the efficient and affordable nationwide delivery of mail. Thank you. I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The amendment has been distributed. Uh, without objection, the amendment will be considered read in an original text for purposes of the amendment. Um, I'll now recognize myself for that purpose. In addition to the retaining every provision of H.R. 2309, my amendment in the nature of a substitute requires the United States Postal Service shift away from expensive delivery of door mail, uh, institutes an affordable and responsible workers' compensation reform, ends an unfunded mandate for bypass mail delivery in Alaska, and allows the United States Postal Service to accomplish necessary workforce downsizing while maintaining to the greatest extent possible those employees who are not yet retirement eligible. And it makes additional technical corrections to the introduced version of H.R. 2309. Once fully implemented, the bill, as amended, will produce a minimum uh, savings of $10.7 billion annually. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. It is the only proposal currently introduced in Congress that includes the reforms necessary to ensure that the United States Postal Service has a sustainable business model, model going forward. Are there any members that wish to speak on the bill at this time? Uh, the, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Postal Service is enshrined in Article I of the Constitution of the United States. It is the lifeblood of rural communities across America and a $1 trillion private mailing industry which employs over 8 million people. The Postal Service ensures that seniors get their prescription drugs delivered in a timely fashion, creates opportunities for small businesses that ship parcels. Chairman Ice's bill would sacrifice all of these valuable services the Postal Service provides in order to eviscerate the Postal Service workforce and the unions that represent their employees. Chairman Issa's bill would close thousands of post offices and mail processing facilities, reduce mail services to five days a week, or for rural areas even fewer, and would eliminate mail delivery for 90 percent of the individuals who have it delivered to their door. In order to dismantle the Postal Service, he would create two new bureaucracies, which would supersede the Postal Service Management, and the Postal Regulatory Commission. These multi-million dollar bureaucracies, new bureaucracies, would be largely unaccountable both to Congress and the American people, but would be charged by statute with ending Postal Service, frankly, as we know it. The bill would not save the Postal Service. It, in fact, arguably could destroy it. Chairman Issa's bill applies a combination of flagellation and bloodletting to a patient who everyone knows is sick. Instead of bleeding USPS dry, we ought to give it the authority and flexibility to thrive in the 21st century. First, we should fix the ill-conceived requirement 
that the Postal Service prefund 100 percent of its anticipated retirement pension and health costs. That's not a bailout, Chairman Ross. That's their money. We also should refund the 50 to $75 billion pension overpayment. These two simple steps would cost taxpayers nothing and would give the Postal Service time to make more fundamental changes in creating a new business model. Unfortunately, Chairman Ice's bill doesn't give the Postal Service the authority it needs to reform its business model. Rather than allow it to raise revenue like any other business, the ISA bill explicitly prevents the Postal Services from engaging in commercial activity unless expressly authorized by this Congress. A strange proposal from a party that claims to be against picking winners and losers. Like Senators Collins and Carper in the Senate and other thoughtful observers, Several of us have introduced legislation and will be introducing an amendment to let the Postal Service raise revenue through the use of its existing network of facilities in partnership with the private sector. I'll also be introducing an amendment to replace the unnecessary and destructive provisions in the bill, which would dismantle the Postal Service and instead relieve the Postal Service of a burden imposed by Congress, retirement prefunding. We should not be stampeded or misled by the false choice presented by the majority in this committee, between letting the Postal Service default or dismantling it through this bill. Instead, we ought to pass legislation that combines short-term reforms on retirement prefunding and pension overpayment with longer-term vision for the new business model. That's the choice we ought to elect for, not this bill. And I oppose it, certainly, in its present form. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. And does any other member wish to speak on the bill at this point? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cummings, sorry. That's okay. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Many of us on this committee and many of us who have been watching postal developments for a number of years have known that we would ultimately get to this point. That is, we would get to the point where we would have to do something drastic about the way the Postal Service operates. And I guess we are at a point where it is necessary to seriously not only analyze and look at, but make some determinations. I have always felt that haste sometimes would make waste. And we have before us a new configuration of the Postal Service. But I am not absolutely certain that we have vetted all of the provisions contained within this bill so that whenever we make these changes, we know that we have done the very best job possible, that we have considered everything that need to be considering. There are many people who feel that five-day delivery, for example, many businesses are concerned that this will deny them the opportunity to interchange their goods and services with the public in such a way that their businesses will continue to be profitable. Of course, my colleague has already talked about requirements that the Postal Service has, that no other agency, government or private, must comply with in terms of prefunding pensions. There is also the consideration that people all over the country now are beginning to look at what the impact I know that in the congressional district that I serve, there are seven postal facilities being looked at for possible closure. The residents feel that they have just gotten to the point where they understand the potential impact. And they recognize that the Postal Service must be self-sufficient, but they are not sure about how you balance services in such a way that 
a whole section, for example, of the city could be denied one single facility remaining in that section. And so, Mr. Chairman, I, I know that you have given consideration, but I do think that there is need for further and additional considerations. I have got two amendments that I am introducing, and so I would not support the bill as it is and would urge, of course, that we not pass it as it is and would yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The ranking member from uh, uh, Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The amendment in the nature of the substitute uh, does unfortunately nothing to correct the extensive and, frankly, confounding deficiencies of the underlying legislation. For example, the underlying bill, H.R. 2309, would require that if the Postal Service defaults on a payment to the Treasury for a period of 30 days, it must be taken over by a control board, similar to the kind of control board previously imposed on the District of Columbia. The amendment in nature of a substitute is even more aggressive, also imposing control board if the Postal Service fails to make a prepayment to its retiree health benefit fund, even though no other Federal entity has to make such prepayments and private firms do not prepay these expenses. Ladies and gentlemen, it is setting up the Postal Service to fail. Although the control board is ostensibly established to overhaul the management of the Postal Service, it seems designed to break union contracts. We all agree that we must urgently address the Postal Service's financial challenges. But solving these challenges does not require that we punish workers who have already made significant sacrifices on both pay and benefits. As I said a little bit earlier, when we consider the fact that the Postal Service has uh, whittled down 100,000 employees since 2008, that says a lot and made all kinds of concessions. The Postal Service has just concluded a new contract with the American Postal Workers Union in April of this year and is currently negotiating with the remaining three of its four unions. Postal workers deserve to have their commitments honored and to know that they can bargain with the Postal Service in good faith. Even if the control board is never activated, passing this legislation will destroy the trust between the Postal Service and its unions. How will there ever be an arm's length negotiation going forward if the commitments in these contracts can be broken? What incentive will there be to come to agreements? And any changes to contracts governing the personnel policies should be made at the bargaining table, not by Congress and not by a control board created by Congress. Amazingly, the amendment in the nature of a substitute expands the attacks on the Postal Service's workforce by authorizing the Postal Service to impose mandatory retirements on its workforce and forbidding severance payments to retirement-eligible employees who are forced out. As I said, between 2008 and 2011, the Postal Service reduced its workforce by more than 100,000 employees through attrition, employee buyouts and hiring freezes. The Postal Service believes it should reduce its workforce by 220,000 more employees by 2015. This is approximately the number of employees who will be eligible to retire by that date. I believe necessary reductions can be achieved through continued attrition and additional buyouts, as my bill would provide. And I agree with Congressman Davis that we need to explore all of those possible remedies to this problem. H.R. 2309 would also establish a presidentially appointed commission on postal reorganization to commend postal facilities be closed, similar to base closure and realignment commission. The recommendations of the Postal Reorganization Commission would come before Congress as a single package for an up or down vote. H.R. 2309 also permits the Postal Service to eliminate Saturday deliveries, an authority the Postal Service has indicated it will utilize and reduce deliveries in rural areas. 
Doubling down on these cuts, the amendment in the nature of a substitute would gradually require that deliveries be made to the curbside mailboxes or cluster boxes that serve an entire street or development. I understand that this is a cost saving. We are looking for cost savings. And it might <clears throat> have been possible for me to support some of such a, ver um, a version of it, but we were given no opportunity to discuss that provision. In fact, while, while there are many provisions in the bill that I could potentially support, the Chairman has been uh, unwilling to work with us to craft truly a true bipartisan bill. Given these unnecessary and unacceptable provisions in H.R. 2309, I strongly oppose this amendment in nature of a substitute and I yield back. Thank you. The uh, Ranking Member from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There, there might be some provisions in this bill that we could, we could agree upon, but again, uh, I, I think the underlying bill as well as the amendment in the nature of substitute contains some damaging and harmful proposals that could negatively impact the Postal Service's operation and survival. Uh, as far as the Section 311, I, I, I reserve my point of order, and I think the ruling of the Chairman was incorrect uh, and that uh, the, the, the ruling of the parliamentarian uh, supersedes uh, the ruling of the subcommittee Chairman and is not subject to overrule by, by vote. That is why we have the parliamentarian. Uh, but on, on the nature of this, this uh, bill, for example, the amendment continues to maintain language that would create a BRAC-like commission to tackle the Postal Service's closings. Uh, the problem with the, look, we have 38,000 post offices. They are near and dear and proximate to many of the people that we represent. This is not a military base that you might have one or two per state. These are, these are facilities that are located right in rural areas, uh, urban areas, and that are used by our constituents on a daily basis. And I think that rather than having a, a, a BRAC process that is operated, a BRAC-like process that is operated by a few individuals, I think the people we represent should have some say in this through us. Uh, we have had closings over the past few years where uh, the Postal Service has designated certain post offices to close, and there has been a great uprising in the community. And we have gone to those communities and said, okay, we have to close down one post office. And, and surprisingly, uh, maybe not so surprisingly, uh, members of Congress have come back to us and said, you know what, that, that postal service, that, excuse me, that post office is a good post office, it's heavily used by the people. We have another one on the other end of town that's not used that much. Why don't you close that one? And we've actually followed the direction of the people that we represent, and they've come up with a better solution. So this BRAC process, or BRAC-like process, I think is going to be fraught with a lot of problems, and it's going to cut Congress out of the whole process of which, which post offices get closed. Uh, I also think that the post office is already within its own uh, uh, sphere, of, sphere of operation already beginning some of the closing process uh, with the large mail facilities, and uh, I, I think this would probably take that out of their hands as well. Uh, worse still, the amendment would grant the so-called control board, this new control board, the authority to break legal and binding commitments made by uh, the postal unions. As uh, the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, uh, noted, we just went through a long negotiation through with the American Postal Workers Union and the Postal Service. And the postal clerks gave up a lot of uh, a lot of potential increases. They agreed to basically a flat uh, uh, wage package going forward over several years. And they did so with the assurances that there wouldn't be layoffs. So after the union sits down with the Postal Service and says, well, if you take, if you take uh, very, very, very modest increases, we will we'll preserve the jobs and we won't lay off. No sooner was the ink dry on that language that the Postal Service came back and said, no, uh, you are going to take you know, very low wage increases over the next few years, but we are going to lay off 120,000 people. I mean, at some point you have to have trust between people. And I, I just think that, uh, you know, three months ago when we began those negotiations between the Postal Workers Union and, and, uh, and, and the postmaster, the old postmaster, the previous postmaster, uh, they said layoffs were not necessary. 
and that they, we could work this out going forward. And then now, uh, more recently, under the new, new postmaster, uh, they're asking to abdicate the uh, power of these people to actually negotiate uh, their agreement and also literally forcing employees who have spent decades of service in the process, these processing plants, post offices, and delivery routes into retiring. This, uh, this bill also introduces a whole new concept. Instead of having post office, we're going to close them down and we're going to put a big box out in the middle of the neighborhood and we're going to have people go get their own mail. I mean, that, you know, that's a new concept and I'm not sure the people that, that we represent are going to like that uh, at all. I notice my time is expiring. I've got more, but we've, we've got more time in this hearing, so I'll, I'll yield back and save it for later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Um, State your inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, when you ruled uh, that Mr. Lynch's point of order was not going to be sustained out of order, uh, uh, you, you made that ruling before you were made aware of the parliamentarian's opinion. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, so the chairman could reconsider in light of the opinion. Is that not correct? <laughs> the chairman could. Yeah. But the chairman probably won't. By way of. <laughs> By way of further inquiry, um, Mr. Issa made a motion to table the appeal of the ruling of the chair. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? As the record reflects. And does the record show any motion actually to appeal the ruling of the chair? I don't recall such a motion being made formally. I, I, do, I do not recall one. Mr. Chairman, if we voted to table an appeal that was never made, uh, I'm just wondering what the meaning of such a motion was. I think it would be a, the, the, the some certain effect would be where we are today that there there is no appeal. I, I mean, but we mo but we moved to table it nonetheless. Oh, I I, I agree. So, so we tabled nothing, and and, and we still have no appeal. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, Mr. Lynch. Uh, all right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. But I, I do want to take, uh, recognize myself for five minutes to just briefly speak on some of the concerns that were raised here. First of all, when we talk about bipartisanship in regard to this bill and we talk about transparency, I don't think there is any more fundamental uh, way to have transparency, to have bipartisan participation than through a public hearing and through the amendatory process. Nor do I think that there is any more fundamental level on which to have this than at the subcommittee level from which it will then go to the full committee. So I think that we are on the right track with regard to the process, with regard to the procedure, with regard to bipartisan support and input. Just because we don't agree doesn't mean we can't work together. The second thing I want to address, of course, is the prefunding, which has been said that no other agency, no other department has to prefund their benefits. Maybe we should require that. Maybe should we should make sure that the taxpayers are protected from having to bail out or otherwise look at somebody's retirement plan because it wasn't funded properly. But even assuming that there has been an overpayment, which I submit that there wasn't, that's $5.5 billion. That still leaves $4.5 billion loss for the fiscal year in 2011. And now let's talk about the, uh, the, 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 um, the $75, $50 billion or $40 billion overpayment that has been alleged out there. And the history will show that back in the 1970s when the, uh, the Postal Department was changed to the Postal Service, that the, this Congress granted to, uh, and I believe it was uh, Postmaster Cox who believed that they should have this formula in place that it was the principal thing to do, and in addition to that, would convey assets of the Postal Service without liability so that the Postal Service could start its, its, its independent business, if you will, not only with these assets without encumbrance, but also have a monopoly to do so. And in furtherance of that, I have asked, and there is going to be a bar, bipartisan letter of my colleagues across both aisles, bicameral, the request from the GAO a determination if the current methodology employed by OPM for allocating obligations between the UPS and the Federal Government is consistent with law, to comment on the actual analysis of the Post Office in, in, um, uh, in, Inspector General and Postal Regulatory Commission for using uh, their assertion that the OPM should refund CR, CSRS contributions and comment on, A, the potential impacts that such a refund would have on CSRS fund and CSRS stakeholders, and, B, USPS's financial outlooks and any other impacts. Now, I've asked, we'll be asking of this of GAO, so why don't you say, well, let's wait until this? Because we are now at September 20th. September 30th, the post office will be broke. It will not be able to meet its financial obligations. We're looking at labor. 
But then the labor that this substitute offers is 150,000 members of the Postal uh, Employee uh, Service are eligible for retirement, not five years, 25 years, that are eligible for retirement to receive full benefits. So we offer them retirement so that we don't have to have unemployment, so that we can make the necessary changes. What I'm getting at is that this bill offers the tools to empower the Postmaster General to make the post office more competitive in a competitive environment. And yes, it is very painful. It is going to be painful. But if we want to see the long-term sustainability and viability of this great institution, I submit that we have to make these systemic changes. And with that, I will uh, recognize yeah. any member for an um, sure. amendment? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Lynch? Mr. Mr. Chairman, just on that point, uh, the, the Post Office will not be broke uh, uh, but for the fact that we are requiring this prefunding obligation. And, and I just want to point out, the normal way that, you know, having sat on a number of these funds uh, as a trustee, the way it normally works in this country, except for this Post Office, uh, is that uh, any benefit fund, whether it a pension, be a pension fund or a health care fund, uh, has to op is required by law to operate in a way that they will meet their obligations as they arise. In other words, you have to be making progress towards reducing your unfunded liability. So uh, you don't have to you don't have to prefund your retirement so that a worker on day one, when they come into your, your into your employment, you don't have to fund their pension on that day because they're not going to retire for 30 years. Well, that's the idea behind this. We, we have funds that operate that, that always have to be operated in a way that they meet their obligations uh, as they arise. We have a special requirement in this bill under uh, PAIA, the uh, Postal Accountability Enhancement Act, which says on a specific date each year, uh, that the post office has to make a payment of $5.5 billion. It says right in the bill. It's very odd to see that in a bill, but it has the date and it has the dollar amount that should be deposited, uh, and that's a prefunding requirement. So that puts tremendous burden on, on the post office in making, making those payments, and that has contributed greatly to the uh, financial uh, decline that uh, the, the post office currently faces, and uh, that, that, that's why we... Uh, have raised the issue of the prefunding requirement that no other range agency or company in this country faces today. Thank you. Understood. Uh, does any member wish to offer an amendment? Mr. Chair. Um, oh, yeah. okay. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk with respect to whether we have six or five day mail service, and I would ask for its immediate consideration. Uh, the clerk will read the amendment. Can you identify it by the number, Mr. Sullivan? I'm sorry? Could you identify it by the number? Do I have a number? Yeah. In the upper if, left corner. If the clerk will wait one second. Sure. I have so much paper on this bill. Yes, thank you. Number, I think, 092. Okay. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia, strike section 111 of the bill. This is a simple and clear amendment, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized for five minutes, Mr. I thank Allen. the Chair. Last year, a joint House Senate committee heard testimony from businesses like Amazon and Hallmark that reducing mail delivery to five days or fewer would reduce the Postal Service's competitive advantage. The Postal Service does have several competitive advantages over its rivals, and six-day mail service, last-mile delivery, and low costs that result from economies of scale are very important in that competitive advantage. Businesses also have noted that reducing mail delivery will hurt America's private sector. For example, in a letter to you, Mr. Chairman, the Financial Services Roundtable, hardly a bastion of liberal democracy, noted that this bill's provisions reducing the Postal Service's delivery week from six to five days will have a negative impact on businesses and nonprofits that rely on the Postal Service's six-day delivery schedule to correspond and send notices to their customers. A coalition of businesses wrote to Chairman Issa, urging that he use other cost-saving measures instead of eliminating one or more days of mail delivery. This coalition included the American Forest and Paper Association, 
the Envelope uh, Manufacturers Association, and 26 businesses, members of the Greeting Card Association, as well as Medco, the pharmaceutical company. CVS and Medco have also expressed concerns that reducing the days of delivery will endanger senior citizens who rely on mail delivery for prescription drugs. The Postal Regulatory Commission found that ending 60 day mail service will delay 25 percent of first-class mail generally by two days. Maybe that negative finding is why Chairman Issa decided to eviscerate the Postal Regulatory Commission's ability to opine and regulate in his bill. That is an unacceptable delay for seniors who need that medicine. Furthermore, we have heard from business mailers that such a decision actually might cause them to pull all of their business out of the Postal Service, thus actually accelerating the decline instead of improving the situation despite the good intentions. Based on these kinds of business decisions, the Postal Regulatory Commission also found that ending six-day mail would produce less savings than anticipated by the Postal Service or assumed in this bill and would produce greater declines in mail volume. In fact, it could actually lead to more losses by the Postal Service rather than any of the savings anticipated. It makes absolutely no sense to pursue cost reduction measures which save the least amount of money but lead to the greatest declines in service, such as ending six-day mail in this bill. Combined, the various measures barely save a billion dollars, five times less money than we could save by simply fixing the retirement overpayment that Mr. Lynch has addressed. We cannot put risk putting the Postal Service on a path of self-reinforcing declines in mail volume, reductions in service, and increases in prices. I ask that you support my amendment to protect six-day mail service and look for savings elsewhere. And I move the amendment. Does any other member wish to speak on this amendment? Uh, uh, Mr. Davis? Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Um, I echo the sentiments that has, have already been expressed and would hasten again to add that I am not sure that we know the full impact of what five-day delivery would do for many of our business establishments. Um, of course, there are people who rely upon the mail service to deliver their medications and prescriptions, but as much as we talk about business opportunities now and talk about the need to protect our business community, I would be in agreement with Mr. Connolly and would urge a passage of his amendment. Thank you. Uh, any other members? Mr. Lynch? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree with uh, the amendment. I support Mr. Connolly's position. And, and, I, and I, too, uh, share Mr. Davis's concerns. We haven't really flushed this idea out. Uh, I, I know the intended consequences here is to, to uh, strengthen the post office. I honestly believe that's what, what the sponsors intend. But um, to be honest with you, if, if, as some have suggested, we eliminate Saturday service, uh, Saturday delivery, um, you know, I can just see the, the situation that will arise if we have a Monday holiday uh, and, and you have postal customers that are, you know, thinking about whether to put something in the mail or, or uh, send it FedEx or UPS on Wednesday or Thursday. They will say, well, the post office is going to be closed Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Uh, so, uh, you know, I am fearful that this will exacerbate the volume of mail that the post office handles. I actually think uh, they are going to lose business and we are going to, uh, we're going to put this post office in a, in a greater downward spiral. I have seen two studies on this that are, that are you know, vastly uh, opposing one another, and I really don't think we have enough information on the uh, reduction to five-day delivery that would allow us to make an informed decision. I understand that the, that the, the sponsor here is, is doing what he thinks is right. I, I, I just don't think we have enough information on it, and so I support the gentleman for Virginia's amendment. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, you I move, move to strike the last word. 
Um, I, I want to simply say that I am not in favor of moving from six-day to five-day. I will offer an amendment that is somewhat similar to, to Mr. Conley's, uh, but slightly different. And uh, But I just want to, on the record, indicate that I am not in favor of moving from six-day to five-day. Thank you. I recognize myself to uh, move to strike the last word. Uh, a couple of things here. One, uh, just this past Monday, uh, our President came out in support of moving from six-day to five-day. Uh, second of all, this does not make it automatic. All it is doing is empowering the Postmaster General, should he need to do so, to go from six-day to five-day. Which day he wishes to choose is entirely up to him. Now, the other thing that it also does is that it eliminates um, uh, or it would save $3 billion annually and is one of the largest single steps available to restore the United States Postal Service's financial solvency. Uh, this proposal uh, for five-day delivery has a number of steps designed to preserve service to the, to the best extent possible. It will continue to deliver mail to post office boxes on Saturday, keep post office o offices open on Saturdays, and continue to deliver express mail seven days a week. Uh, public opinion polls have shown large majority support a five-day delivery service over alternatives such as raising postal rates. Uh, is there, are there any other members who wish to speak on this amendment? Seeing none. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Connolly. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're gonna uh, roll call these. Yeah, yeah, we got time. Let's go ahead and roll call these votes. Is that all right? Drag yeah. In? yeah, okay. Well, hold on. Apparently, I, we have votes in judiciary right now, so I may, we may just roll this vote without objection. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Does any member wish to offer an amendment? Uh, Mr. Shannon? Yeah. Okay. Who, who asked? Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Mr. Mr. Lynch? Chairman, I have an amendment to the desk. Uh, number 28, please. Clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment to the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Lynch of, Lynch of Massachusetts. Strike titles 1, 2, and 3 of the bill and insert the following. Title 1, recalculation of postal service pension obligation. Section 101, short title. This title may be cited as United States Postal Service Pension Obligation Recalculation and Restoration Act of 2011. Section 102, modified methodology. A, in general, Section 8348H of Title V, United States Code, is amended by adding at the following, at the end of the following. 4A, to the extent that a determination under Paragraph 1 relating to benefits attributable to civilian employment with United States Postal Service is based on any provision of law under subparagraph C, such determination shall be made in accordance with such provision and any otherwise applicable provisions of law subject to the following. I, the average pay used in the case of any... I, I ask for unanimous consent to, to waive the reading. Yeah. So ordered. The, uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. I thank the Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment would strike Title I, II, and III of the underlying bill and the amendment in the nature of substitute and replace those titles with the full text of my bill, H.R. 1351, which is the United States Postal Service Pension Obligation Recalculation and Restoration Act. While I believe that Chairman Ice and Chairman Ross share a genuine commitment to ensuring the long-term viability of the Post Office, I am concerned that H.R. 2309 does not set forth a practical framework toward achieving our common goal of placing the Postal Service on a firm financial footing. As previously stated, I think that this legislation will result in additional levels of postal bureaucracy. It will reduce customer service and it will actually punish the postal workforce. Additionally, the underlying bill fails to address and rectify the Postal Service's $65 billion 
overpayment of its civil service retirement system pension obligations and the $6.9 billion surplus it has paid, uh, overpaid to the Federal Employee Retirement System. As many of you are aware, the United States Postal Service Inspector General, as well as two independent auditors working with the Postal Regulatory Commission, have found that due to an outdated actuarial methodology, the Postal Service has significantly overpaid its share of civil service retirement system obligations for those postal employees who served both the taxpayer-funded post office back prior to 1972 and the ratepayer-funded United States Postal Service that exists today. In addition, the Office of Personnel Management has determined that the Postal Service has indeed overpaid into the Federal Employee Retirement System account by nearly $7 billion. Uh, given these significant pension overpayment issues, I am greatly concerned that the bill put forth by Chairman Issa and Chairman Ross ignores a very practical and viable alternative to enhancing the Postal Service's financial position. In contrast to H.R. 2309, the language contained in H.R. 1351, my bill, and this amendment would not uh, compromise the agency's institutional commitment to universal delivery standards, fiscal responsibility, customer service, and employee rights. In light of these concerns, my amendment would strike Titles 1 through 3 of the underlying bill and insert the language contained in H.R. 1351 to correct the Postal Service's pension and overpayment issues. As we continue to work on long-term postal reform proposals that reflect more of a commitment to bipartisanship and rational solutions, I do hope that the majority will understand the importance of once and for all correcting the unfair treatment of the Postal Service's pension contributions requirements. Lastly, I would note that H.R. 1351 enjoys the support of over 200 members of Congress. I have got uh, 204 members who have co-signed uh, onto my bill, including 24 Republican members, uh, the, uh, which demonstrates the likelihood that the language would pass the full House. However, I am not certain that that is the case for H.R. 2309. So in closing, I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support this amendment as a more reasonable and thoughtful approach to improving the Postal Service's financial condition, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Any other member wish to speak? Uh, chairman Issa. I thank you, Chairman. Uh, with all due respect, there is a separate piece of legislation, uh, which, by the way, does not include all the elements in this amendment. I, I noted that you, you managed to kick a few more bucks into it. Uh, but having said that, even OPM's statement was really that there may be temporary amounts. Any use of this kind of legislation would result in no net savings of the cost of operating the post office. So although these kinds of financial shifts uh, for a short period of time could well take care of a liquidity event, and as I said when the uh, ranking member of the full committee was here, that we may need to find ways to fund liquidity during the transition of this business unit, that simply putting less money away for retirement when actuarially in the years to come, if any of the projections come true as to the size of the post office, the fact is we will need more money and have less people to, uh, to provide that. So I regrettably although I, I see that we may use some of the elements here, some of the elements of the President's proposal as part of transition funds, since these amendments, in my opinion, gut the ability to bring real reform to the cost drivers of the Post Office, do not bring a material change in how we deliver uh, services, it fails to deal with, deal with the underlying cost that eventually will swamp the Post Office unless we make those changes. I do appreciate that it would be a liquidity event and, again, uh, would pledge to work with the gentleman on transitional funds if at a later time now or at the full committee you want to begin looking at how do we transition nearly 200,000 workers in a short period of time properly off of the payroll of the Post Office. And there are a number of good suggestions that are not in the underlying bill, and I will be happy to speak with the gentleman on it, but I will be opposing this amendment in its form and yield back. Recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I fully support Mr. Lynch's amendment, and um, and I couldn't disagree with the chairman, Mr. Issa, more. Uh, this is not a bailout. This is their money, 
As a matter of fact, we are in this pickle because we, the Congress, have required a NOVA payment. We required something we require of no other agency in terms of 100 percent prepayment. And so this is actually money owed back. And it would, it would almost instantly return the Postal Service to solvency. It is such an obvious answer. This bill chooses not to take it. Why? Because, of course, exactly what Mr. Issa just accuses Mr. Lynch of doing is what he's doing, forcing us to make choices we don't need to make in a rush because there's a different agenda. The agenda is to break the back of public employee unions. That's why there's a provision in this bill on Davis-Bacon. What's that got to do with the Postal Service's solvency? There are provisions that would take away the rights of the Postal Regulatory Commission to do its job and regulate. There are provisions that jeopardize the right of collective bargaining of the Postal Service employees. And just to make it all perfect, we actually make sure that the new commission that we uh, create gets at some numerical targets to essentially eviscerate the workforce of the Postal Service and break the back of the pub public employee unions. Now, you might say this is just democratic rhetoric. But if you look at the history of this committee this year, it has been nothing but a platform to attack public employees and their rights to organize, whether it be inviting the governor of Wisconsin or looking at various hearings or looking at various pieces of legislation. And this one enshrines everything we have heard in this committee before. So it is not about, do not be seduced by rhetoric that all we are trying to do here with this bill is to improve the Postal Service. No, we are not. There are lots of other ways of improving the Postal Service. Many of us have introduced legislation which has been ignored that would do just that. So I support the Lynch Amendment as one obvious step to return the Postal Service to solvency and that will buy us thoughtful time to think through the future of the Postal Service and create a new business model for the 21st century. I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? Of course. I thank the gentleman, and, and I know he didn't mean to disparage, dis, disparage my intent, uh, but I, I felt a little like he might be. Uh, yes, there is a Davis-Bacon waiver in the legislation, but that doesn't affect employees. It would affect potential contractors, and uh, I would hope that that could, be, that could be clarified. And for the gentleman from Virginia, I do not for a moment doubt the, your legitimate belief that your technique and this, this amendment of Mr. Lynch would, in fact, give back money that is not withheld from any other agency of government. But the post office, with its autonomy, with its ability to set its own uh, basically wages and benefits, is not any other agency of government. And this was a bargain that was, that was dealt with I, on a bipartisan basis. I hope I the gentleman will remember that. I, I thank the chairman. And certainly no intent to question motives, question agenda. I now, uh, I now yield to the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you. Uh, the gentleman has stated in his earlier remarks and also uh, more recently uh, about the, the inability of, of this amendment and, and basically this bill, 1351, to reduce costs. But uh, in, in our discussions with the Senate and also with uh, with the Postmaster General, uh, they would, the, the Post Office would have the ability, if, if the FERS uh, overpayment were refunded to the Post Office, they would have the ability to offer an early retirement uh, uh, program to the 150,000 postal employees who have already earned basically full retirement. A lot of these people haven't retired because when the, when the economy collapsed in 2008, they saw their, their uh, thrift savings plan reduced by about 40 percent. They saw their houses reduced uh, by tremendous amounts, depending on where they live. And so a lot of those people kept working because they were afraid to retire. I think that if we offered a, a fair and reasonable early retirement system using the money that is already owed to the post office, we might be able to move a significant uh, number of those employees uh, off the payroll into retirement. And I think that really would. I really think that would reduce the overall cost of the post office operations going forward. So 
Thank you. I yield back. I recognize myself to strike the last word. You know, it is interesting, even if we were to, to strike the provisions of 1, 2, and 3 of this uh, substitute, what we still have is a systemic problem. What we still have is analogous to trying to subsidize a buggy whip manufacturer in light of the creation of the internal combustion engine. We have to make sure, as Mr. Connolly pointed out, that the United States Postal Service is prepared to compete in the 21st century. And what this is doing is allowing, this bill is allowing for that systemic changes. If we want to incentivize the retirement of 150,000 employees who are eligible to do so, this substitute amendment provides for a collateralized loan of $10 billion to do so. What we need to make sure is that we take care of the future so that the services that have been provided, the services that are expected by the American public, carry on and continue. And with that, I recognize Mr. Davis. Thank you. I think the uh, ranking member has presented a very thoughtful amendment. Um, I would, I support it, urge its passage, and I would yield to the ranking member any additional time that he might might desire. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, I want to just posit another difference between um, what the full committee chairman is suggesting. He is saying that as part of his bill, he would, he would increase the uh, debt limit for the Postal Service during this transitional period by an additional $10 billion. It is already $15 billion. And then he's gonna, if, if this bill passed, we would increase it to $25 billion, it would be due back. It would, you know, they would have to pay it back eventually. But what I am suggesting is that by using the money that is owed to the Post Office, and, and there may be fights about the CSRS, but there are not a lot of fights about the calculation uh, being used on the Federal Employee Retirement System. That money is owed to the Post Office, $7 billion. Why not use their money to accomplish what we are trying to do here instead of taking $10 billion in taxpayer money, giving, it, giving that money to the Post Office and then waiting to get it back, I, I just, uh, it just, it, it just uh, it's confounding that we would, uh, we would not acknowledge uh, monies owed to them. I know it doesn't work great on scoring on our, with our budget rules, but I, I think it's a far better way to, to address the, the dilemma that we face. I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? Mr. Davis, a, a gentleman, I yield to the uh, ranking member of the full committee. Thank you very much. You know, I was just listening to what uh, Mr. Lynch was saying. Thank you for yielding. Um, you know, one of the things that that uh, is very upsetting to me is when I hear these words "bailout, bailout, bailout," and what you just said, Mr. Lynch, seems to go against. I mean, it's it's consistent by doing it the way you're proposing then you are not talking about this bailout that we constantly hear from our Republican colleagues. And I get confused. I mean, it seems like arguments are adjusted to fit various scenarios. But clearly, if it is their money and they are able and we are able to use it to resolve this issue, it is very important. And, I, and one fundamental difference is taking place here. And I, I was listening to that. I, kept, I keep, for some reason, you know, what uh, Chairman Issa said a little bit earlier is just echoing over in my mind. Um, the whole idea of being fair to our employees. Um, I think, you know, a lot of this boils down to how are we going to address these employees? Are we going to kick them to the curb and say, you know, you know do the best you can with what you don't have? Or are we going to try to address them in a compassionate way? And, I, and that's why I support this amendment. I, I, Mr. Ch the Chairman of the Subcommittee, I, I think this does put us in a position to treat that fellow who delivers mail to you and the ones that are going to come complaining to you at the store this weekend by losing their jobs. I think it does help us address their problems in a much more effective and efficient way. And, you know, if, if you're talking about a bailout, this is, this is the Lynch, what Mr. Lynch is trying to do, and Mr. Lynch can certainly speak for himself, is, is do just the opposite of a so-called bailout. 
and that is to use these folks' own money. And I would yield to Mr. Lynch. Back, yield back. Uh, Mr. Would the gentleman from Illinois yield? Yes. I thank the gentleman. I think we have found some common ground here, even though it is sometimes hard to decipher it and it is not in the amendment. But I certainly think that the, the Chair has expressed to me, and, and I certainly would express to all of you, that finding a way to be fair to accelerated retirements, uh, early retirements, or, as you said, people who are fully eligible but find it very difficult to, uh, to go to retirement without some certainty of, of additional income. All of those items are anticipated but not yet in the bill, and I, and I hope that that is part of what the dialogue here today, the reason we had a subcommittee hearing, is all about. I look forward to that. Uh, Mr. Lynch is absolutely right uh, in that we, and Mr. Connolly for that matter, we could, yes, it happens, Mr. Connolly, we could, in fact, find this $7 billion. One of the reasons that it is not our choice in the bill is that our concern is that the full faith and credit of the American people are behind the pension. We would rather honestly loan and keep it on the books in that way. But if passing this bill were possible today and we were only dealing with where we get transition money, we would work that out, I am sure. The problem is, Mr. Chair, Mr. Ranking Member, is that we have to come to the reform, possible reform possibility, and then we all have to be fair to these longtime Federal employees. And I would only ask one piece of indulgence, uh, Mr. Chairman. I was in the military many, many years ago. I would long have been forcibly retired because the military has a schedule of up or out. It is not nice to be 45 years old and told your services are no longer needed as a master sergeant, but it happens every day. One of the challenges for the post office is that has not been part of their culture. The transition has to be fair to them, and I want to be fair. But I think for men and women in uniform who are leaving with a $1,000 or $2,000 pension midlife, we have to understand that the Federal workforce has to meet the needs of the American people, not just the American taxpayer meet the need of Federal workforce. So I hope we can have that dialogue positively because I do look at our, our senior NCO Corps in the prime of their life being sent out with a very limited pension, and I know that tough decisions are made. They can't necessarily be part of the military going forward at 60 or 62. We have to look and say, how do we get the best, reasonably young workforce right-sized? And I, work with, I want to work with all of you. Mr. Davis, thank you for your time. I know the dialogue doesn't seem positive, but my hope is we are finding common ground here and yield back. The gentleman yields back. Any other members wish to speak on the amendment? Uh, Mr. Lynch. All right. Well, uh, just uh, to the gentleman's remarks, uh, it, it sounds like there might be some opportunity for common ground on this, uh, on, on a perfecting amendment that uh, if, if we could, uh, you know, ascertain the certainty of, of uh, uh, some relief, some early retirement incentive to those uh, employees that, that, that want to take it would have to work out the details and things like that. But, uh, you know, I, I would certainly be willing to work with, with the chairman um, going forward um, either as a perfecting amendment to his bill or, or to, uh, you know, a a wider negotiation with the Senate as well, because this is going to be a bicameral solution. But uh, I think if we could agree on that as being one uh, one element of uh, you know a successful piece of legislation, then uh, I would certainly commit to working with the with the chairman and the subcommittee chair as well. Would the gentleman yield? Certainly. Uh, I will make the commitment to you as I made over the phone uh, to uh, Senator Lieberman. We know this has to be bipartisan and bicameral. We know that we have to have a solution that is long living, and we know we need transition funds and to be fair to the workforce. So I look forward to working in good faith on that. Uh, I don't expect that everyone on our side will vote for a final passage if it, it does some things they don't want, and I know the same is true on your side. But I think this committee has a special opportunity. And, in the week before or two weeks before we bring this to the full committee and before it goes to the floor. I hope we address all these issues, and I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Wish to be heard. Uh, I yield. Thank you. Thank you, the gentleman, for yielding. I want to, want to thank the um, chairman of the full committee and 
for, for what you just said. Um, you know, I just, I'm, many of us are going to, well, see, I, I have it a little different than most people. I live 40 miles away from here, and I see these, uh, I see people worried about their jobs every day. I go to the post office every, every Saturday, and I see the employees, and many of them, most of them, are well beloved because they are part of the fabric of the community. And I live in an urban area, but I would imagine that the closeness of these employees in rural areas is probably even more significant in many instances to their neighbors. And every chance I get and every chance we get, I think we need to do what Mr. Lynch is trying to do and what the chairman has talked about, and that is trying to make sure that whatever we do, we do with a high degree of compassion. Um, sometimes I wonder whether we have a compassion deficit in our country. And I think that if we can find a way to help the unions and the postal service, I, I, I got to tell you, the more I think about the idea that we've got a system that has shedded 100,000 employees in three years, and I'll never forget the hearing that we had where one of those postal union presidents sat in that end seat right there, and I think he was so upset because basically I think what he was saying is, what do you want? You're squeezing and you're squeezing and you're squeezing, and you act like we're not human beings. You're acting like we're not your neighbors. You're acting like we're not the people who deliver your mail every day. You're acting like we don't matter, and we've done all that we can do. And we're willing to do even more, but work with us. And that's what I'm hoping that we, this is all about, us working with them. And, Mr. Lynch, I applaud you for trying to find a way to make that happen. Because let me tell you something. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You can erode from the inside. You know, we worry, I just, we worry so much about the outside. We can erode if we don't have strong systems. If we don't educate our people, if we don't take care of our people, if we don't find ways to keep them employed, if we don't keep, uh, have, keep a way to, to, to let them do for their families, you can erode from the inside. And so when we've got a system here like the Postal Service that has given us blood, sweat, and tears and continue to sacrifice, and we've got these unions who have come to the table, and the unions have come to the table, and I'll bet you that you can't, you, I mean, if you really listen to what they've said, They've said, we will make the sacrifices, but damn it, we want our bargaining rights, and we'll work with you because we believe in shared sacrifice, something, by the way, we all need to be uh, attuned to, shared sacrifice. Shared, everybody, rich, poor, everybody. And so um, I'm looking forward to the negotiations and whatever we're able to work out. And again, Mr. Lynch, I want to thank you for the, your amendment, and I fully support you. And with that, I yield back to the gentleman. Any further members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Lynch. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. And there's a requested uh, roll call vote. We will roll that. Um, uh, as a, a recorded vote on the amendment offered by Mr. Lynch will be postponed pursuant to committee rules. And now I believe we'll stand in recess and go vote and come back and finish our amendments. I was just curious whether the chairman really meant to say we were going to roll this vote. <laughs>